Um, so let's give a warm welcome to Dr. Eric Bing. Thank you, Heather. Uh, and it's really, it's, 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 it's wonderful to be here. Um, again, this is the, you're the, my fourth cohort uh, of, of GHC fellows that I've been really privileged to work with. Um, uh, and working with you guys really has changed my life. And I'll tell you a bit about it uh, uh, in a moment. Um, but this is a huge group. This, this is like, it, it's, it's a village. <laughs> I guess uh, it takes a village, so I guess we need a village, so we're really happy to have you. Um, uh, and uh, I, I did just come back to, from Bali, uh, so I'm really chill, it's nice. Um, but, but I rarely go to Asia, so people kept asking me, where are you going? I'm saying, oh, I'm going to Mali. Like, you're going to Mali on vacation? I'm like, oh, I'm sorry, Bali. <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's a little bit different. Um, uh, and, and I've actually been doing this uh, for, for a while now that I, I kind of feel like um, a GHC fellow. Um, and uh, I was speaking to one of the uh, GHC fellows um, at lunch, um, and uh, the person who won't be named uh, asked me, well, what are you doing here? I said, oh, I'm a GHC fellow. She says, you are? <laughs> I said, N no, not really. She says, I was thinking those were 30 rough years. <laughs> So, and you know who you are. <laughs> um, uh, so, so I'm really, really, really happy to be able to speak to you uh, today about um, uh, a, a program that I developed for the GHC fellows um, um, about four years ago, and this is, you're, you're now the fourth group that will be, that have the opportunity to go through it. Uh, it's called I Did It, and I'll explain where that, that name came from, the title comes from, but it's really about creating the life uh, meant for you. Um, and this is meant to be very interactive and engaging, and I encourage you to talk. I have all your names right here, your pictures, so I know who you are. <clears throat> uh, but more importantly, I've read each of your strengths finders. <laughs> uh, so I actually know a little bit about you. Um, and I hope that strength finders actually helped you learn a little bit about you as well. And we're going to talk about the strength finders um, uh, today. Um, uh, and so, you know, one of the reasons that um, I got into medicine, I'm a physician, um, is that I just love kids. And if we think about them, I mean, everybody's saying, ooh, and oh, is it cute? What is it about kids that we just love? What is it? You can shout it out. The joy, the innocence, the wonder, the chubby. So, 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 so what is it about these young kids in the potential that we see? What is it about them that we just get excited about? Anybody? Raise your hands or I'll call on you. What is it about these young people whose lives are in front of them that we just get so excited about? Expressive. They're expressive. What else? Their sense of wonder. Anything else? I'm sorry? Uninhibited, yes. Anything else? Yes. How quickly they learn. Any men like babies too? <laughs> Anybody else? Curiosity, yeah. They're curious, they wanna learn, they wanna grow, they wanna develop, and in them we see tremendous possibilities. We see all the possibilities in them that they are. And because we're connected to them, their possibilities are our possibilities. And that's actually what is so incredible about seeing all these young people. But unfortunately, not all babies are like the ones we just saw. Seven million young people under five each year die. Die because they don't have basic health care, basic support. But I ask you, 
does this baby have value? So this baby has value. Is this baby here by a mistake? No, no. So if this baby has value and this baby is not here by a mistake, what I ask you is, is there a reason for this baby to be here? What do you think? I'll call on you. Does, is there a purpose that this, this baby can achieve? Yes, yes. So regardless of how poor or how disadvantaged a life is or a child is, they have a purpose, a unique purpose that they are here to achieve. And it's really a baby like this, a young girl, who was born into poverty that helped me understand the importance of purpose. Uh, she was a baby who was abandoned by her own mother when she was just six weeks old. And they didn't know where to take her, so they took her to this old woman who already had 15 children, and she was raised as this woman's 16th child. And when she was 12 years old, she had to go begin working, and she got a job as a maid in rich people's um, house. Um, and soon after, she got pregnant, and then had five babies in total. Uh, and the reason why I know this particular person so well is that this is my mother, and she was the one who was abandoned. And the remarkable thing about my mother's life is that you know, even though she didn't get educated, she had about a 10th grade education, um, and she had lots of kids. I was number five. <laughs> um, when she died, it was as though the most important person in the world had died, not just to me, but to so many people. People flew really from all over the world to see my mother go, to send her off. There was the whole chapel was filled, and then there was these ante rooms where we had to put up um, cameras uh, so people actually could see the funeral. And, and what was so remarkable about my mother's life, and I spent a lot of time with her before she died, and I said, Mommy, I don't understand. You know, you were rejected, but you didn't do that. You, weren't uned you were uneducated, but you made sure that we were educated. And you know, of my brothers and sisters, you know, there's four doctorate degrees there. I have two of them. <laughs> um, the, uh, and, and the most, she says, you know, my mother rejected me, but my mother was also rejected. She was also abandoned as a baby. My mother, I had, Babies very, very young, but my mother also had babies very, very young. I didn't have an education, but neither did my mother. And I decided that it was going to stop with me, that I would not reject people, that I was here to give unconditional love, that I was here to accept all people, that while people couldn't see my own value, I was here to see people's value. And that's what she did her entire life. She saw people's value and she loved them unconditionally. And she really changed the world. This was not something that she could see easily, but over in time she began to see it because we often don't see ourselves the way others see us, as you may know. And that is how she changed her life. And that's really when I began sort of thinking about, well, what am I here to do? What's the purpose of my life? And that's when I began sort of doing my own sort of deep inner work, thinking about why I'm here and what gifts I have to give. Uh, and so, you know, I ask you, if there, if these babies, have purpose, and my mother has purpose, and what about other people? What about you, Pamela? <laughs> or Drew? 
or Jen, or all of you, what is your purpose? What is your reason? Are you here by a mistake? I know you might bounce a little bit on the slide, <laughs> but where are you going when the bounces in life hit you? What is your purpose? And that's what we're gonna talk about today is not only what your purpose is, but how to get there. So let me ask you, um, do these babies have purpose? <laughs> Are they here by mistake? <laughs> no, they're not, definitely not. <laughs> so I want you to, uh, I'm gonna let you hear from one of the fellows from uh, two years ago who I still speak to, I'll be talking to her next week. This is um, Eliza Ramos uh, who was in Rwanda. She wants to give you a little message. Hello, fellows. Welcome to um, the CHC family. And Cedric says hello. Uh, we're here at the Gardens for Health Farm in Rwanda. Um, and congratulations on, um, on being a part of this. Um, I hope you guys are having a great time at Yale so far. Um, so you're probably wondering who this quirky, passionate man is in front of you. Ignore that. Um, and not going to lie, I was, a, I was a little bit skeptical of the whole idea of this program at the beginning. Um, but to be honest, joining I Did It was probably one of the most transformational um, programs um, and parts of the GHG experience. Um, so I joined because I really felt like I had a lot more work to do um, on myself and on how I made, wanted to make a difference in the world. Um, and I'm not gonna lie to you, um, this program really makes you think and dig deep with yourself, and sometimes it's a lot harder <laughs> to... <laughs> See, even that's difficult for him, even talking about it. Um, sometimes digging deep into yourself is a lot harder than trying to solve um, the problems in the community that you're working in or the problems in the world, but I guarantee you that if you are willing to put in the time and the energy and the effort to do this kind of inner work, um, it will definitely pay off in the long run. Um, so enjoy this presentation, enjoy the rest of training. Um, congrats again on, on this accomplishment and we can't wait to see many of you soon. Bye. So that's, that's Eliza. Um, uh, and Eliza worked with me uh, two years ago and well, Eliza still works with me and I still work with Eliza uh, because uh, she continues the work. Um, uh, it really, really is just an incredible person. Um, but what she talks about is that we really sort of focus on solving, helping communities realize their potential, seeing their own good. But in order for us to do that, we really need to see our own good and realize our own potential. And that can be sometimes, well that's almost always much harder to do than to work on the external world. But given that the external world is really a, a reflection of what's going on inside, we need to focus on inside as well. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about sort of how you do that and how some people do that. Um, and sort of borrowing from, um, uh, and th sort of the main th things that I'll be talking about today is one, sort of know where you're going, sort of three things. Uh, know where you're going, and if you wanna take notes, you can, I'm, I won't be offended. Um, uh, and actually, I'm a professor, so if you don't take notes, I will be offended. <laughs> uh, know where you're going, uh, using s your natural strengths to get there, and then how to check your compass daily. Because if you're on a path, if you aren't, if you don't know what you have in order to get there, you're probably not gonna get there. And if you aren't checking your compass, about where you're going, when you get off track, you're going to get lost. And we're going to talk about sort of how you can do that. So one of the things that Cheryl talked about that is being really, really critical is knowing your North Star. Knowing your North Star. Why is that important? Knowing where you're going, why is that important? It's kind of a rhetorical question, but you can answer it anyway. Yes. Absolutely. 
Go ahead. Yeah. Um, well, because I'm going to quote uh, Stephen Covey. He wrote The Seven Habits of Highly Effective Teenagers. And there was one part that talked about beginning with an end in mind. Like, because if you're going to just start a trip and not know where you're going, you might end up in a million different places and waste a lot of time. Good, good, good. Yes. For motivation. For motivation. Yeah, yeah. So for motivation to keep you going. Anybody else? Yes. If you don't know where you're going, you don't know when you've veered off veered off path and are going the wrong way. Yeah, yeah. And that's actually what, you know, these are some really great responses because it's so important to know where you're going. And you know what your North Star is. I can guarantee you, you each know where your North Star is. The reason why there is a North Star, we sort of talk about the North Star, is that when people were navigating the seas, and this is before they had GPS and all kinds of stuff, they had to write themselves. And they had to look to the North Star to figure out, am I going this way? Am I going that way? Am I going this way? And so the North Star was always the brightest star in the sky. Whenever it got dark, it was the first thing that they would see. Whenever it would get cloudy, it would be the first light that would appear, it would be the North Star. And I can tell you, I've been around the block a time or 20. Um, there will be many, many, many times in your life when it will get dark and where you won't know where you are going. There will be so many times, I can guarantee you, because you probably already had them, has anybody had any dark times in their lives? Yeah, yeah. You've had them already. You know about them. It's the first thing that catches your eye that gives you hope again. It's when you see it and you see it like, I'm found. It's there. And it's different for every single person. It's different for all of us. So I can't tell you what your North Star is, but I can tell you when you go in the dark, when you get lost, and you see it, you know you're back on track. That's what the North Star is. Does that make sense? The paradoxical thing is that once you know where your North Star is, you find that you get lost more often. Has anybody experienced that? Anybody? Why is that? Yes. Okay, so you're trying so hard to get there that you do things wrong. Anybody else? You can be too focused on something that you can often close yourself off from other opportunities or things that may be better for you, depending on how you're changing with your life experiences. Uh-huh, uh-huh, good. Uh, anything else, yes? I think it's just easier to see when you're off track, when you know what your North Star is, so you feel like you're lost more often because you had somewhere where you were going. Perfect, perfect. And that really, all these are good answers, but this really, from my around the block times, this really is what it is, is be when you know where you're going, you know when you're off track and you write yourself. I'm off track. I write myself. I'm off track. I write myself. And so it seems like all of a sudden you know where you're going and you're off track all the time. That's actually not true. It's just that you're aware of it more. And that awareness of bringing yourself back, bringing yourself back is the muscles that you're building. It's very much like being in the gym. Um, and I can sort of see, while the men here don't talk a lot, I can see some of you have actually been to the gym a fair bit. So what happens? What happens when you lift weights? It's not holding the weight that actually makes you strong. It's actually pushing it up. 
and pulling it back and pushing it up again and pulling it back. That's what makes the muscle strong. And that's what makes our mission muscle strong is getting off track and coming back, getting off track and coming back. So you're gonna notice that you're gonna get off track more often, good. Because it means that you're just aware. And I've gotten a little bit off track too, so let me go back. <laughs> so what do organizations do? Y yeah? Uh, thank you, I actually want to, co to comment about that. So, um, I, and I want to give an example of uh, Victor Frank, uh -huh. who was a doctor and who survived from the concentration uh -huh. camp. Um, so they say that knowing where you're going is uh, like an energy that keeps you transcend the sufferings. And even in medicine, we use it uh, with patients because everybody has what we call um, like an instinct of death and an instinct of survival. So when you have patients who are struggling with uh, like very severe, serious illnesses like cancer, uh, HIV AIDS, mm -hmm. it's important to help them to have sense of their purpose because it helps them to struggle and transcend uh, with hope all the obstacles. Absolutely, and I couldn't say it better. Anybody else want to have a comment here? Well, thank you. And so let's sort of talk about what other organizations North Star is. But one of them you actually know because it attracted you. It pulled you in. And that's GHC's North Star. Its mission, we're building a shared belief that health is a human right. So what did that do? What did that North Star do to you? It pulled you. Why? because you were aligned with it. And if you weren't aligned with it, um, uh, either you, you're really convincing <laughs> that you are, but you got in, but most often it repels you. If this is not your North Star, you go away. This is not where I'm going. And that's what a North Star can do, not only for ourselves, but for others, it'll pull them. The Gates Foundation, we work to help all people lead healthy, productive lives. This is what some fellows have talked about. This is Eliza, who we saw earlier, to be a catalyst for individuals and groups to reach their full potential. Uh, and if anybody knows Eliza, and I know a number of you do, this is definitely Eliza. This is not anybody else, this is Eliza. Lauren Smith, uh, who was at GHC in Zambia two years ago, said to help others build simple, human-centered solutions to complex social problems. And these are their words. And even if the, our missions are, are similar, our words will be different. And so we're gonna talk about sort of those words and how you do that. So how do you craft the mission? Who here has a, a mission statement? Their own personal life mission? Anybody? You do, yeah, you do, sort of. I'm not gonna ask you what it is, don't worry. <laughs> Anybody else? crafted their own life mission statement? You do, good. You do, very good, I'm glad. <laughs> it, yes, you do too, well, good, good, good. Well, um, at the end of this, all of you will. Within an hour and a half, you will all have a draft personal mission statement. Okay? So, now somebody's waving, fanning themselves, because it's hot in here, all of a sudden got real hot. Because one of the things that, it, it actually really is hot in here. <laughs> um, one of the things that a lot of people get nervous about is that they think that it absolutely has to be perfect and it's not going to change. And it's gonna be all over the internet. And people say, you're off mission, what are you doing? <laughs> no, all you're going to do is just draft it, just put some words down. I'm gonna sort of talk about how to do it. But I wanna give you, we're all sort of involved in health in some capacities. So let me give you sort of an analogy in health. 
Who has ever gotten on a scale like this before? Good, good. So you've gotten on a scale like this before. So when you, and did you weigh yourself? The nurse did it, okay. And when, she, and who else has gotten on a scale like this? Many of you. When you get on the scale, do you start at zero and begin moving it over? What do you do? Anybody, what do you do when you get on the scale? Yes. You put it in the right direction. Good, you put it in the right direction. What else? Yes. Yes, yes, yes. So you, 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 I'm not gonna tell you how much I weigh, but I would not put, start at 100 and move, 100 pounds, and move over. I probably wouldn't start at 150. I probably, I, if I could get to 175, I'm happy, but I'm probably gonna start at 200 and then begin tapping left and right. Where is it? Is it this way? Is it that way? Is it this way? So, and that's actually the way most of us are with our mission. Don't try to get it perfect. Just like get it within 30, 40 pounds, and then you can start tapping it over the next year as you begin thinking, as you begin evolving, as you begin, because wherever you are, wherever you end up, it's probably going to be approximately correct. You might have to sort of move it over a little bit. That's okay but you're just gonna go for an approximation. Is that okay? So we're not looking for perfection at all. And you're not gonna to have to tell everybody what it is, maybe. So how do you craft your mission statement? So the first thing I want you to do is to write down in your, your GHC book, your little book, um, is what types of things do you love to do? Now, answer this next question. What types of things come naturally to you? That's, what types of things can you do that's almost effortless? So next I want you to Close your eyes. And I can see you. And as you close your eyes, I want you just to get centered here in this space where we are, what you're experiencing, what you're hearing, what you're feeling. Visualize yourself sitting here. Just be here for a moment. Take some deep breath. And now you're going to, with your eyes closed, see yourself moving through time. Not now, but in some future time. Time is passing. Time is passing. And you're going to find yourself at an event. going to be a lot of people who are gathered. Did you visualize the event? Did you see it? Some of the people in the crowd you know. But there's a few people in there that you don't know. You don't know them because you have not yet met them. You don't know them right now, but you will meet them at some point. And as you're looking around, you realize that you are not there. And they're talking about you. Because where you are is at a service for you after you've gone. And these people have come to gather, to honor you, to talk about you in the way that you have impacted their lives. A 
look at the way they are dressed. Look at the place around. For some of you, it may be a happy time. Others, it may be a sad time. It will be different for everybody. And I want you to go up to somebody in this crowd that you don't know now. The person you're going up to is somebody's life that you have impacted by your own. And this person is there because they want to honor and thank you for what you have done that has impacted their life for the better. That because of you, their life will never ever be the same. By the work that you've done, you've changed them. Speak to them silently and ask them why they're there. How did you change their life? How did you impact them? And listen to what they tell you. Now I want you to find another person whose life you've impacted and ask that person the exact same thing. How did they change? How was their life impacted by you? And when you're done, you can open your eyes and write down on your paper some of the things that you heard, some of the things that they told you about how you changed their life, how you impacted their life, how their life was made better by you. And then we're going to go to the final question. What do you consider to be your most important contribution to others in the world? and complete the sentence, I am here to complete that sentence. Well, I can see you guys had a fair bit to talk about. I saw a few high fives. I saw people a little bit intimidated to, to the talk, but everybody really talked. So what I would like to know is if anybody would like to brag about what their partner wants to do. Yeah, so what do you, what do you want to brag about? You can tell. I thought it was really beautiful what he said. He said that he hopes that people would, would remember that he helped people feel worthy of being loved. Good. He is here to help people feel worthy and be loved, and feel being loved. Who else wants to talk about what their partner said. Yes. Are, are you just stretching? Uh, he said he wants to uh, connect um, people who are demanding for health services and people who are on the supply side of health services using appropriate technologies so health can be accessible by everyone Great. in the world. Great. Perfect. I saw a hand here. Yeah, actually, we're thinking of throwing an African dance party, and I found the, the DJ for the party uh. here. <laughs> Violet, she loves bringing people together, and she loves dancing, and, and also she's being an awesome DJ. Good, <laughs> good, great. Yes, yeah, so I saw one over here. Um, I had two great partners, and one um, wanted to bring people oh. happiness through simple acts of kindness, which I thought was very sweet. Um, and the other one wanted to help people that, were, that felt invisible. Good, to help people who feel invisible feel visible yeah. and who, who, want, who wants to practice acts of kindness and presumably change the world through that. Who else? Right here. Yes, I'm sorry. 
Mm. <laughs> oh, my friend here says she is here to give everyone a chance and a possibility. We live in a world which is devoid of chances. And if you have someone willing to give a chance, I mean, you have to, you have no choice but to yeah. give a hand for that. Yeah, very good, good. To give people a chance and to have them recognize that they do have a chance. Yes. Um, basically, she is here to inspire people and to go out and explore as much of the world and experience as much of the world as possible and bring that inspiration back to the people that help create who she is as a person. Good, good. So she wants to go out in the world and see inspiring people and be inspired herself, and be inspiring herself. That's beautiful. Who else? Well, over here on this side. Yes. Okay, uh, she wants to free all women in the world. Free women? And from free women come free men, so we're all free, so thank you. <laughs> um, Melissa had a very vivid and touching picture. So um, a man tells Melissa that, um, that the book that Melissa wrote talking about, which asks women around the world um, what, what future like dreams they have for their daughters. Mm -hmm. um, so the man says that the book validated his mother. Mm. That's beautiful. As a man who was validated by his mother, I, I, I thank you. <laughs> who else wants to brag about their partner? Inspire us. Right here? Yes. Um, well, I had two partners as well. Uh -huh. And I just Greedy. thought that they both fit them so well. So one of them wants to help educate people to empower them to make, to, to grow. And the other one wants to learn and be taught from people around him. And he wants to also help and teach those around him too. Wonderful. Very inspiring. Beautiful. Um, and I wonder if one of you can tell us how inspiring she is, because I feel that she's probably pretty oh, inspiring okay. too. <laughs> Which would you like to you wanna take it? Ellen is extremely inspiring. She wants to help children live better lives. So it can't be more inspiring than that. That's incredibly inspiring. And one of the reasons why I just did that is because it's very hard for us to talk about our own purpose, our own passion. However, it's very easy for us to talk about those people who inspire us. And so remember, as you share this, you are inspiring people. So don't hold it in. Don't hold your purpose in. Give it away. People will be inspired by it. So if you don't give it away, you're hoarding. <laughs> give it away. That's a gift. Yes. Um, my friend over here, he wants to create a world where sports can be used as, can be used to create social justice and friendship among all. Very good, thank you. Anybody else? Yes. Um, my partner wants to empower communities and bring about positive social change through various activities like building da um, uh, what did you say? <laughs> yeah, like improving water and sanitation by building dams, valley dams, in those rural communities where they are neglected. Very good. Well, thank you. And so these are all incredibly inspiring. So I want to give you, now that you sort of listened to this and sort of thought about this and let it incubate it, if you want to go back and tweak what you wrote, I'll give you like a minute or so to go back and just tweak what you wrote. If you feel perfectly great with what you wrote, just keep it right where it is. And on that little piece of paper, that little blank piece of paper, if what you finally come up with, just write it right there. Remember, you're stepping on the scale. It's not perfection. It's not the final thing. Just stepping on the scale. Yeah, so and, and, uh, a few minutes ago I asked you, who here has a draft mission statement? Now I want to ask you again, who here has a draft mission statement? 
perfect, perfect. And now you have 12 months to figure out where exactly on the scale it is. This isn't perfection. This is just plopping the thing down. And now you have 12 months to tweak with a K it. And as you go through these next 12 months, you can use this to help guide your decisions. Major decisions that you have, who you work with, how you work with them, the kinds of value that you give to your, your job site. Do you get married? Do you date? Do you not do any of these things? Who do you marry? Who do you date? These are the kinds of things that are important. Is this person in alignment with where you know you need to go? And at the end of this, where are you going? Where are you going to end up? Is it going to help you get to where you're going in terms of why you're here? And sometimes we got to make a wrong turn to realize we made a wrong turn. That's okay. Yes. I feel like this mission statement, the one that you just exercised us through, is like very focused on what you want to do to others. But my original mission statement was just for myself and my personal mission statement, which it doesn't conflict with this, it augments it, but it really has not a lot to do with what I want to do to others. And so, and what's the question? I'm challenging your mission statement exercise. Um, in, in what way? I don't think this totally reflects our personal mission statements because we have so many different compartments of ourselves. And maybe it was just me reflecting the exercise that this mission statement is what I want to do with others. But it really didn't have much to do with how I want to improve myself. And so everyone will use the exercise in different ways. And that's OK. Because, for example, you might have spoken to the person and they said, how did, how were you impacted? Well, I saw the way you lived your life. I saw what you were doing with your own passions and I was inspired by that. So you may have lived your life about something that's very, very personal to you, but others were actually affected by it. So even though you weren't necessarily focused on the others, others were definitely changed by it. Does that make sense? And so however you define it will work. So we're just getting on the scale. And then we're going to tweak it with a K. Yes. I do think, though, that that's the, a really challenging thing for me is figuring out a mission statement that's kind of specific and unique enough to be kind of my own, <laughs> but, also <laughs> but also broad enough to encompass all the parts of myself. Like, am I thinking of myself as someone going into global work? Am I thinking of myself as a daughter, as a sister? Like, you know, so I think it has to be broad enough to kind of fit every part of you. That's maybe the challenge. Yes, ma'am. Um, actually, it kind of felt opposite in that this was the first time that this personal mission statement was, I feel like I was more honest this time just because uh -huh. the person that I envisioned was um, kind of the person, like, it was me, the, yeah. the person that I was talking to, I guess, yeah, yeah. Um, in that the way that they envisioned me was someone that I wished I had for myself. Yes. So, yes. I, I, 
I kind of get like how that might feel a little bit selfish to uh, write, uh, but at the same time, I think if I can work towards this toward for others, uh -huh. it'll kind of work both ways. So yeah. that it is, you know, a personal mission statement, but also um, like a driving force and why I want to help others, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. I, I, thank you. Yes. I just needed to seek clarification because I'm getting a feeling as if a mission is statement that we've just written down is a cornerstone of what you're going to do in life. If I understood you clearly, uh, this is a guiding principle, and I know as life goes on, as we venture more, things might change, but you have something to drive you on, if I got you right. Absolutely, absolutely. And so this is just to guide you, and it will change slightly a bit as you move on. Uh, and this is, and as you know, I didn't ask you, how are you going to get there? How are you going to get there? Because you don't actually know. Let me give you an example of a story that, uh, that one of the former GHC fellows had. Um, uh, and this person was from uh, Uganda. And we were on Lake Kivu in Rwanda during the uh, mid-year retreat. And he sort of like didn't say anything in the group, but then he sort of cornered me in the, the boat uh, when I couldn't get out. <laughs> And he says, I need to talk to you, I need to talk to you. He says, you're a doctor. Um, and I feel as though I can't achieve my mission. I sort of think about it, I just can't achieve it. And I said, what, what was your, what's your mission? He says, my mission is to be a doctor. And I feel as though I have failed because I did not get into medical school. My grades weren't high enough to get into medical school, so I have failed my life mission. My life is worthless. Um, and I said, well, what do you do? He said, well, I had to go to agriculture school, but I didn't really want to go to agriculture school. And I said, oh, I said, do you like agriculture? He says, yeah, it's actually kind of fun. It's kind of interesting. And you get to do all these neat things and whatnot. And so we, and I, I sort of went, we went sort of went through this whole exercise that you just went through and about him sort of visualizing this service for him at the end. And I said, and he sort of came back and he says, I said, what did you learn? He says, I learned that I should, be a, I should have been a doctor. I said, why? He says, because I met this woman, and this woman thanked me for saving her baby. This baby is alive because of me, and now the baby's going to die because I'm not a doctor. And I said, how do you know how you save the baby? Did you give the baby a vaccine, or did you strengthen plants so that this baby did not die of malnutrition? Did you do something else that allowed this baby to live? And do you think a mother will be more appreciative of you saving her baby by giving it a vaccine, or saving her baby by saving it of starvation? Does she really care? She doesn't. So you can achieve your mission in lots of different ways if you know where you're going. Opportunities will present themselves. And that's actually sort of how you begin to make these decisions. And you can make it even minor things like your to-do list. You have a to-do list every single day. You can look on your to-do list and say, hmm, all these things are things that I have to do. Which of these things are more in alignment with my personal mission? And you move them to the top of the to-do list. And you do those early on. So that way, at the end of your day, if you've achieved nothing but the first couple of things, at least they're in alignment. How many of you get through your entire to-do list every single day? I don't see any hands raised. <laughs> I assume that nobody does. You don't want the stuff that's most in alignment at the bottom, things you don't do. You can, all the things that you're sort of thinking about, you can actually use these things.
So we've talked about knowing where you want to go. But the next question, I should have presaged this, but how do I get there? And that's why we talked about the strengths. And that's actually why I had all of you do the strengths finder. Did you, I guess the question, did, did anybody learn something about themselves that they didn't know before after they did the strengths finder? Yeah, you were surprised. Yeah. Uh huh. In what way were you surprised? Uh, because, oh, that's loud. <laughs> because some of the things that I felt, I could not put the name on it like input, and I was very surprised to see that I was reading exactly how I felt. So it was telling you things about you that were true, but you didn't know it. You didn't see it. Anybody else? Yes. I can probably get there quicker. <laughs> Raised you. Um, mine said that I was very good at keeping people from getting distracted, which is not necessarily something I think of myself as doing. I sometimes think that I distract people and go off on tangents. So I thought that was really interesting. And, and one of the things that the strengths finders will do is sort of bring us things that surprise us. And I would encourage you to sort of look at it and maybe even ask people, do I distract you or do I help you get focused? Because uh, sometimes it actually does bring some insights. Yes. Actually, it honestly made me a little bit more comfortable and confident going into the position I'm going into this next year. Uh -huh. Because in order, the strengths are kind of the most crucial strengths I think I need to have for my specific role exactly. in this job. So that was pretty cool. Yeah, very, very good, very good. Um, and what the strengths finder is, let me sort of move on. The strengths finder is not just muscle strength. I look at the strengths finder as gifts. They are gifts that you have been given. Gifts that you have. And just as you said earlier that you're not here by mistake, when you came here, when you got here, when you showed up, you came with some gifts. So I'm not from all the countries that you're from. So this, this might be a little bit different where you're from. But where I'm from, when you go to a party, well, I ask you, wherever you're from, when you go to a party and you bring a gift, and you, it's a big old party and there's like food and dancing and having a good old time, what do you do with the gift when you get there or before you leave? Do you like put it back in your pocket and walk away with it? Or there's different cultures, I don't know. <laughs> what do you do with your gift? What is it? I can't hear you. You give it away. You leave it there. It is not your gift. It is to be given. Because we didn't all get the same gifts. You have to give your gift. It is a gift that you give away. So therefore, you have to use the strength. You have to give the strength so that we all benefit. And as you know, if you read your strengths finders, the things that you read there, you cannot not do. You actually have to effort yourself not to do them. So give them freely in an alignment with your mission. So these are really gifts that you have. And the strengths finders comes up with these 34 different profiles, and they come out in the order that they are strong. So for example, you may have connectedness or achiever or strategic first. Somebody's shaking their heads, I must have. <laughs> I should have known what your strengths are. Um, so that will be the strongest one. Then the next one comes, then the next, then the next, then the next. Number one is going to be stronger than number five. It's the way you enter the world. And one of the things that you probably also noticed 
is that there was interrelationship between some of the strengths. Did you notice that? Sometimes it was saying the same things over again. It's like, yeah, I know that. <laughs> because these strengths are bleeding into the other ones. Because we're not five different things. For the most part, we're generally one or two or three different things that expresses itself in a number of different ways. And so that's actually sort of the way the strengths finders come out. Uh, and so uh, there are four major themes that you will often see in your strengths. One of them is executing. This is achiever, arranger, belief, consistency, deliberative, discipline, focus, responsibility, restorative. These are all things about executing. Uh, and I call this, and pardon my French, getting shit done. These are the kinds of skills, the gifts that allows you to make ideas happen. They're all a little bit different, but they're all about making things happen. You also have influence. This is, these are the people who can sell ideas, can take charge, activator, command, communication, competition, maximizer, self-assurance, significance, woo, which is winning others over, selling things. You need these people. Another one is focusing on relationships. It's the social glue. It's the, and you know who you are. It's the one who keeps people together. Positive energy, caregiver. That's adaptability, developer, connectedness, empathy, inclusiveness, individualization, positivity, relator. These are all about relationships. And then finally, there's a category called strategic. And these are the people who live in the world of ideas, in the world of possibilities, in the world of what could be. And that's analytical, context, futuristic, ideation, input, intellection, learner, and strategic. Does that make sense? You, you, you've all seen yours, because you've, hopefully you've read your, your profile. Uh, and uh, did you guys get an email from my assistant like yesterday or today? Um, I, actually, I went through all of your profiles and categorized you so you actually could see where you were strongest. Uh, and some of you, most of you, are in a couple of different categories. Some of you are in just one category. That's where you're really, really strong. So these are the four categories, strategic, executing, relationship and influence. So you guys have now been together for about almost two weeks, right? Where do you think you guys fall? What, is, what do you think is the biggest category, the strongest category for the group overall? What's that? Relationship. What else? Anybody, anybody else think something else other than relationship? In, well, sorry? Influence. Influence. These are movers and shakers, taking charge kind of folks. Spread out. Okay. Uh, so so if, if, um, but what is the highest, strongest? Um, I guess influence, but I would guess it's pretty even distribution. Okay, you think it's influence. Great, great, great. Who else? Um, relationship, influence, anything? Anybody else? Yes. Executing. Executing. Getting shit done. These are getting shit done folks. <laughs> what else? Strategic. Okay, okay. So who, you can only vote for one. Who here thinks strategic is the highest? Okay, who here thinks executing is the highest? Who here thinks relationship 
is the highest. And who here thinks influence is the highest? Okay. This is what we have. 82% of you have qualities that are strategic. Ideas, possibilities, hope, seeing the world as it can be. It's the highest of everything. It's not that surprising. But tied with that virtually is relationship, is valuing others, being social glue, bringing people together. That's the second highest. And almost up there with is getting shit done. Folks who can execute, who can make it um, happen. And then um, influence is actually um, one of the lowest ones. The, the influences ones is the ones who are the calling attention, calling action, um, taking command, taking charge. Um, so, uh, um, is, is anybody surprised by this? Yes. Like, in order to execute something, you may have to have some kind of influence on others. Uh -huh. So I'm just curious why influence is so low and executing is so much higher. Yeah, so part of this is sort of what these are. So influence is activation, stimulating, command, taking charge, communicating, getting your, your, your word out, competition, uh, maximizing, self-assurance, significance, woo, whereas executing is, are just slightly different. They're, they're, they're similar but slightly different. Yes. Since we may have scored um, more than one in the same category, how is that factored in? Like if we um, had one in influence versus if we had two of our top five in influence, um, was that, is that different? It, it is, it, it is. And part of it is where it falls. So if it falls at like one, it's a heavier weight than if it falls at five. Um, and, and what I did is that I weighted these things as I um, began putting it, giving you your score, whether this is a very, very strong or a strong or it's not existent, on, as your top five. Um, if it's toward the top, it's gonna have a stronger influence than if it's toward the bottom. So, um, how many people, so we sort of saw this. Um, I guess the next question is, how many of you feel as though, uh, if you had um, very strong on your thing that my assistant had, it's, that means that there was more than 50% of the weight was in one category. What I want to show you is how many of you had more than 50% of the weight in one category. What you see is it now begins to drop some. 32% of you had more than half of your weight in strategic, in the world of possibilities, in the world of what can be. Re next, relationships, interconnectedness, social glue. Executing is down at 15%. That's where half of the weight was. And then influence is down at 2%. So what, what, so sort of thinking about the sort of next um, months and, and really sort of what you um, have going on, are there ways that you feel as though you can strengthen your strengths or do you feel as though you should try to strengthen your weaknesses? What do you think you should do? Yes. I took this three years ago, and I fall into the very strong category here, but the other ones have oscillated quite a bit. Is this something that as you grow professionally or within your career that your strengths do change, or kind of how does that work? Maybe if you do work on them, they strengthen them? Yeah, and so your, your strengths are going to be things that are natural and that, or that you've then acquired over time with skill. Uh, and generally, they don't vary that much and often they don't move category to category. 
they will generally stay within a category. I've done this a couple times too. Um, and it tweaks, a tweak with a K, a little bit. Uh, but there aren't um, huge differences. What I have noticed is that as I've um, begun aware, become aware of my strengths and begun focusing my strengths, they've gotten a lot stronger. So there's less maybes, um, you're likely, and much you're definitely. The words that they're using have changed. Anything else about this? Yes. I mean, generally, if you took any survey multiple times, wouldn't your answer generally get stronger towards one thing? It's like a survey bias, I feel like. Okay. When you were answering these questions, did you know what it was you how it was going to come out? No, but you do. Um, actually, I don't. Oh. <laughs> I don't. <laughs> and I've only done it twice. I've read hundreds of these, maybe a thousand of these. I've seen a lot of them, um, uh, but I've only done it twice myself. Uh, any other questions? I just had a thought on your question as to whether we should be strengthening our strengths or strengthening our weaknesses. Oh. And influencing, I think, I mean, it shows that it is a little lower, and I think that that's reflected in not all of us, but many of us having a hard time articulating what our mission is, and that's what we've been working on yesterday and today, because the influencing, I just read through my email to see what the descriptions were, and it's kind of selling your ideas uh -huh. inside your organization, also outside. So if, I mean, if we can do all these things really well, we can make a change in the world, but to make a big change, people have to know what we're doing. Okay. People have to know what you're doing. So in order for you to achieve your mission, people have to know what you're doing. And so one of the most important things, and we'll talk a little, a little bit later on about it, um, is that you need to talk about what your mission is. Because if you talk about what your mission is, who are you going to attract to you? People going in the same direction or people going in different direction? Same direction. You're now attracting to you people who are going in the same direction but they're coming with different gifts. You're going to begin attracting people to you who are going in the same direction but have gifts that you lack, that allows you to stay in the gifts where you're strong because they probably are lacking in that capacity. And they then give you some of the things that you need. Does that make sense? This is one of the ways that these gifts are interrelated. We don't have all of them. So what I'd like you to do now is, you know, now that you've sort of talked about your, your mission and your strengths, if you could just sort of write down what strengths do you have that can help you achieve your mission, and what strengths do others have that can help you? And then really, the, finally, the question is, how can you use yours and other strengths to help you achieve your mission? The thing that you've already worked on. And like last time, I want you to turn to somebody and talk to them about how you can use yours and other strengths to achieve your mission. Preferably somebody you spoke to about your mission so they know that part. And spend a, about six minutes on this. Okay, is there anybody here who would like to sort of talk about some insights that they heard from this exercise, from their partner? Anybody? Anything that you heard? Or you could eat, yes. Um, so Robert is a very process-oriented, get shit done type of person. <laughs> um, it's why she can manage to deal with motorcades and security details for G8 summits and that kind of thing. And uh, so she's very good at like keeping keeping everything moving, um, and uh, she looks forward to working with people who are maybe a little bit more creative, out of the box, um, and, but she tends to keep people grounded, and I think that's a big strength of hers, and so, yeah. Good, good. And so you are able to get stuff done, keep things organized, um, and um, uh, do you want to strengthen that? Well, I'd just like to say that I had no strategic um, top five, so I guess I'm in the two percent. So I'm gonna need all the creative energy um, from this group. 
Yeah. I guess. And <laughs> so um, you are in the 2%. You are one of the most valuable people here because nobody has it. <laughs> so um, when you have very rare strengths, you become very, very valuable. So you don't want to be like all of them <laughs> because if you're like all of them, we lose you. We need you. We need all of you because all of you, while collectively there may be some similarities, as soon as you go into your placement, you're going to find people who are vastly different than you. You're common here. When you go to your placement, you're going to be very uncommon. They need you to be you in the way that you are gifted. Use it and be it. And that will then free them up to be themselves. Does that make sense? Okay. Any other comments? Yes. Thanks. I was discussing with Melissa that um, possibly the reason why in the influence category a lot of us weren't scoring very high is because we're still young professionals and I don't think we've really had the opportunities in some of our positions to um, really like cultivate that skill set. And I think if we were to take this in just a few years, the percentage of us with that, that strength would definitely be higher. Okay, good, good. And it may be. But if it's not, that's okay. So my, I can get up here and talk. My influence is non-existent. I don't have it. I'm very high in strategic. I'm very high in relationships. And the way I get influence is that I have people around me who are really, really good at it. And so it actually may look like I'm doing all this stuff. Uh-uh. They're doing it. I have almost zero execution. I can't get anything done. <laughs> I have a SWAT team around me of people who basically handle me. And that's the way I can get stuff done. And it allows me to stay in what I'm really good at. We can't all do that. And I'm not saying that you should not do the things that, you're, that don't come natural to you. You gotta learn those things and particularly in many of your placements, you may be the only one or two with some of these skills. And so you're gonna develop some things that don't come natural to you. Embrace that too. So I'm not saying don't do things that don't come natural. Embrace it. Yes. I, I think all of it's a product of where we came from. And like you're saying, we're young professionals, but I know that you worked in DC and so I feel similar about the no influence, but then again, I had a job where I had to be an executor. So I think when we get to our placement sites, like mine could totally flip and I just wouldn't even know it. Yeah. Um, uh, and, and I think that you will see, and I would imagine part of the reason why you did so well in your last job is that um, it required it and you were good at it. I also am in a, in a place that does policy, but I don't do it the way other people, I, I'm around, all executors, I don't do execution. They do execution. Because where, I'm, where I am, they need people who do relationship. Yes. Um, I was wondering between those, among all those four strengths, um, are they like two who can be compatible and make like a superpower? <laughs> <laughs> um, all of these things are compatible because as you know, to achieve your mission, collectively you need all this stuff. You need to attract it, pull it in. And you will be a superpower. That's the way you are powerful, is by knowing what you have and attracting the things that you need. And collectively, we are powerful. Collectively, we are powerful. And so how do you do this? We sort of talked about one is finding your North Star, knowing where you're going, what excites you, what pulls you, knowing what your gifts are, 
And then the final thing that is really critical important is knowing what your compass is, having your compass and checking it each and every day. Am I off course? Write yourself. Move right yourself. How do you check in each day with your compass? What that really, that really is, is mindfulness. Being mindful and seeing the things as they are and not as you want them to be. And you may have heard, I would imagine a time or two by now, the concept of mindfulness in this training. Re daily reflection, understanding, and that's really what this is. So it's not surprising that two weeks in, you probably heard this multiple times because it works. And it really is, if you sort of think about it, a drop in an ocean makes tremendous waves as long as it's still, but you drop a brick in turbulent water, it makes nothing. So the way you become mindful is that you actually just get quiet and you listen. And you can do this with meditation, you can do this through journaling, there's lots and lots of different ways that you actually can do this. And in a couple of months, I'll offer to coach some of you through some of these things. Um, and I'll also put on my website, a website that was developed by a GHC fellow, I will add, um, uh, different ways that you actually can be mindful. And so I'll have some tools out there um, in a couple of months. Part of the reason I'm doing it in a couple of months is that you need to uh, like get settled first before I, you jump into this stuff, because this stuff gets a little bit deep. Um, in a couple of months, the stuff will be available. So why am I here? Why, I've, I've talked about all of you, why am I here? And why am I here talking to you today? Well, the thing that came up for me when I first did this, and I, when I did this, there was not a this to do, I just like did it. Uh, it came to me, it was really clear that I am here to help leaders create social impact. I help leaders create social impact. I don't do it myself. I help other people who have a social consciousness, who want to create this, a better place. I am here to help them. That's why I've flown here today. This, is, this isn't my job, I don't do this stuff. I, I create health systems in my job. But this stuff that you are doing is so important to me that not only do I take my time, I actually have created a program to help. And I've worked with many, many fellows. Of all the things that I do, and I, and I say this without any hyperbole or any exaggeration at all, of all the things that I do in my life, working with GHC fellows is the most meaningful. It is absolutely the most meaningful thing that I do in life is working with you guys because you are the reason I believe I was created. You will have tremendous impact in the world. You are young, you're energetic, and you will change this space. And anything that I can do to help you is the reason I was created. I strongly believe that. How do I do that? I use my strengths. Here are my strengths. Number one is strategic. I'm always thinking about how do I get this done? How can we use this? Where are we going? But it's not about me because number two is connectedness. I don't see separation between me and you. You are me, I am you. It's, many people will look at the world like this. What they, when they look at a hand, what they will see are, I can't do this and hold this at the same time. <laughs> they will see four fingertips. They, they sort of see it, four fingertips. When I look at it, I'm looking beneath, and I say, wait a second, all the fingers are connected. Each is part of a whole. 
each is interconnected, and the fingers only function when you function together as a whole. So therefore, how can I achieve my mission through working with you? Is because you're not separate from me in the way that I see the world. Connectedness. Number three for me is ideation. I'm always looking for ideas, and my ideas are almost always about people and how to make things work. Number four is individualization, is I see every single person as different and unique and special. And while I may have put you all in four categories, there's tremendous difference among you, and that's what I, that's my gift. And then five is arranger, but the way my arranger is arranged, my, all the arrangements is about putting people together for them to achieve. And so the way I actually came up with this program, to be quite honest with you, is I sat down and I looked at my purpose, and my purpose was helping people achieve impact, helping leaders achieve impact. I looked at my gifts and saying, okay, how can I use my gifts to actually achieve my mission? And I said, I can begin teaching, I can begin coaching, I can help people do this. And this is the way I created the program. This is actually why I do this. So why do I do this? Because I wanna help leaders create social impact. And in particular, I want to help you. I want to help you do what you are here to do. So my last final thing is you've all written on that piece of half piece of paper what your personal mission is, this draft thing of just like stepping on the weight. If you would do me the favor and write your name on it. And give it to one of the, the interns. They won't read it. Only I will see it. But I will check in with you once or twice during the internship. Just drop you an email, see where you are on it. Uh, any last questions? Um, and if you feel to finish your evaluation, you can also uh, uh, turn those in as well. Uh, any last questions for me before we end? Yes. In your analysis of human behavior, do you use a bit of artificial intelligence? So uh, in my analysis of human behavior, uh, do I use artificial intelligence? Um, uh, not that I know of, <laughs> but it, it's something that would actually be very, very helpful. Uh, we, actually, I, we actually do use it in some of the stuff that I do with the Bush Institute, but I actually don't do it uh, in my work of human behavior. But it would be very, very helpful. Uh, any other last questions? Yes. I noticed that you're missing the influence part on your strength, so I just want to find out how you're working towards achieving that because there's some uh, strength parts that I feel I'm lagging behind and I would love to learn how you're working to get the influence part so that I can apply it as well. Okay, so the, the one thing that I, I hadn't anticipated was by me helping people, I would attract a lots of people just like you who have skills that I don't. So for example, um, influence is about calling attention to things. So it was like so hard for me to develop my own website about calling attention to myself. So I went to a GHC fellow who was really strong in influence. I said, what do I do? And he basically said, this is the way you do it. Not only that, I'll do it for you. Um, I have people who are really, really skilled in that and I help them around mission and those kinds of things, and they help me in the things that I'm just not good at. And they don't even sort of think that I'm not good at it. They think that I'm actually good at it. Uh, I am better in other things. Um, we had one last, uh, uh, I, I know we're out of time. Uh, one person here, and this is actually the first time this has actually happened, knows the child that was in Eliza's video. So you want to tell us a little about, who, who was the person? Oh, there you are. Who knew that? Yeah, the video, please. Yes, Can you, you want to show the video? Yeah, yeah. Not, not just, yeah. A 
Okay, yeah, thank you. Uh, uh, we all know Elisa, and I would like to introduce you one of my best friends. He's called Cedric. We live on the same farm, and uh, the reason why I wanted to introduce uh, him is because uh, he's one of the persons that uh, inspires and uh, like help us to understand our missions. The reason why is because uh, he, his mother, he has a uh, has like a serious uh, mental health issues. So he was a small uh, children who was abandoned at one of the health centers. And when they have found him, he was so small that even adults were, were afraid of taking him in, into their arms. And now, because people have like worked together, they have uh, taken care of him. Now he's a very energetic, a small boy. And we always fight because he's like always running on the farm. He wants like uh, to pull out my, my, my crops. And I say, Cedric, no, no, don't do that. And uh, the reason why I'm sharing this is because uh, he's one of the proof that when people work together, they can uh, achieve uh, their missions. It's uh, one of the person that who inspires me a lot because he proves me that uh, uh, like we can fight childhood malnutrition. I can work to fight childhood malnutrition, and because he's very energetic and that now he's uh, in a v he's very healthy, he makes me believe that change exists. And uh, this is I, I wanted just to put a name on his face. He's called F Cedric, and he's one of my friends. Thank you. <laughs> well, thank you so much. And you know, hopefully I can now call you all of my friends as well, uh, because your success, I believe, is my success. So go discover your mission, appreciate your gifts, do your daily work, and change the world. Thank you very much.